Well, thank you all for joining the Permeable Pavement webinar today. My name is Mark Gray. I'm the Director of Environmental Affairs for the Building Industry Association of Southern California. And I'm also the Technical Director for the Construction Industry Coalition on Water Quality. We had a super great response to the webinar today. So we know it is uh, timely and useful for all of you in doing your jobs. Today is a condensed higher level look at permeable pavement technology from a few foundational perspectives. We had a physical event planned for the end of March that was truly comprehensive, uh, working with our great partners, Orange County Public Works and Orange County Parks. But the COVID-19 pandemic uh, got it got in our way. So our intent today is to keep you interested and informed about the topic and to let you all know we still plan on doing a physical half day seminar as soon as we get the get the green flag to assemble safely. To that end, we're going to be working with Orange County Public Works and Orange County Parks to hold an event later this year at a location which is when you see it apropos for the time of respecting social distancing. Uh, we have planned on doing it at Freedom. We plan on doing it at Freedom Hall Miles Square Park, which is a gem of a facility and highly welcoming. We look forward to holding the the seminar and seeing of all all you there uh, in, in, in later in 2020. So now a note about our sponsors. A huge thank you from Kickwick and BIA of Orange County. We could not do such an event uh, as this and our planned physical event without them. For each of, each of these companies is truly a leader in stormwater management in some respect, especially in low impact development practices with talented people who work there and support education and information sharing. It's my mission and purpose to facilitate that and I'm honored to do so and, and to be a part of it. So today we're gonna to highlight porous pavement technology design considerations, construction considerations, next generation pavements and technologies, and wrap it up with key operations and maintenance issues. Each speaker will give you their background and has about 10 or 12 minutes and we'll leave room at the end for questions and answers uh, at, at, again at the end of the hour. Please pose your questions through the question and answer uh, function and not through chat, please. So first up, uh, Brandon Wilnicker from GHD. Brandon, take it away, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And let me just share my screen. Give me one quick second. All right, thank you to everybody in the audience and thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Brandon Wilnecker, and I'm a regional stormwater leader at GHD, and I'm happy to be here today to uh, give some insight and some basics about design considerations when it comes to permeable pavements. As Mark mentioned, we're going to each give a brief introduction uh, to the audience. I bring over 23 years of professional experience and practice throughout the Southwest, Alaska, and the Midwest to this presentation with an expertise in municipal projects, as well as infrastructure that's associated with them, civil site design, stormwater quality, and most importantly, over the last five years, uh, sustainable and resilient practices. And in my career history, I've been able to manage local and regional projects, ranging from master plans and water quality studies to H&H &H analysis for both large and small land development projects, redevelopment projects, municipal and institutional projects across the region. I am a QSD and QSP, and some previous experience I've had, I've had the privilege to have nationwide and international stormwater and water quality regulatory experience to be able to bring to the Southern California market. Well, why are design considerations important? Well, as specifiers, we, we like to think that we design perfection many times, but their client is ultimately what matters. And here are a couple of examples of Leaning Tower of Pisa. You know, did that take all considerations into, into effect? Who knows, uh, look at the result. Uh, then we look at parking lots where we see ponded water or maintenance crews out there repairing things for longevity. And in the picture in the bottom right, we see some settled pavement. So when we look, when we ignore design considerations down the road, it could lead to cost impacts and systems not functioning as, as we planned. So this is just a brief introduction into why design considerations are important. So 
Uh, my few minutes have been broken down into five capstones, the first being why we need to consider our design for pervious pavement. So we first ask ourselves a question, why are we even considering uh, porous pavement to be used on a project? It could potentially be required through a condition of approval. We could be a private developer and it's just personal choice. Could be to satisfy regulatory requirements for either water quality or flow rate reduction or something of that nature. It could be to seek a credential or certification, either LEED or green building code or Envision or something of that nature for sustainability and resiliency. And also pervious pavements may be able to be used where there's a limited availability for pervious and green areas to substitute for those. So when looking at pervious pavement, many of these are the reasons why. And as Mark mentioned, we're gonna just briefly touch on these. So I would ask if you wanna get into more specificity and detail, either pose it as a question or wait for the half day seminar where, we'll, where, where we will do a deeper dive. So the second design consideration for uh, porous pavements are what are the goals? Um, many times in stormwater related areas, the goals are runoff and volume reduction. Is it treatment or pollution prevention or capture and infiltration or aesthetics? These are many of the goals for why we see pervious pavements used today. So it's important to not, not just understand why you wanna use it, but what is the goal for using porous pavement? A third area of design considerations are where to apply pervious and porous pavement technologies. Uh, today, many uses include curbs and gutters, sidewalks and walkways, parking lots, alley gutters, and driveways. So understanding why and the goals also helps us understand where we want to place them for maximum effectiveness. A fourth design consideration is the technical end. As specifiers, it's end, to our end users, it's important that they get the solution that they desired, paid for, built, and functions. So when looking at porous pavement, it's much like another pavement or storm drains or sewers there's considerations to make sure that we're getting the right solution for the project. And when it comes to pavements, you think of traffic, whether it's vehicular, pedestrian, or bike or other modal methods. It's important technically to understand what are the vehicular traffic counts? What's the type of loading? Are we talking passenger cars or trucks? What are the underlying soils that will support and allow pervious um, solutions to function? Are we connecting to downstream infrastructure or counting on infiltration and percolation only? What is the operation and maintenance enforcements that are there? Do municipalities have O and M plans set up, or even the physical infrastructure to be able to maintain such solutions? What is the desired service life? What is the constructability and the installation allowances? It's possible that a solution specified on a plan may not be able to be built due to vertical and horizontal constraints. Um, using porous pavements in ADA pathways, ensuring that it's compliant so frankly like high heels and wheels and other things are able to function under code, and then color and aesthetics. These are all technical considerations that need to be applied when looking at designing a pervious pavement to again ensure maximum functionality and delivering the goal to the client. And then lastly, and I'm sure the other three gentlemen are going to speak more towards to what the types of pervious pavements are, uh, but in considering designs, it's important to know what are the options out there to achieve the goals and the results for both the specifier and the client. And on the market today that I've seen and talked to the gentleman here are precast, there's pour in place solutions, there's prefabricated, there's plantable, and many times these are based on cost and performance. So hopefully this, these five design considerations have given uh, the participants on the call something to think about, that it's not just laying pavement down and looking at grades and things like that, but there's a lot more to be considered. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over to the next presenter and thank everybody for their time. Hi, good morning. It's, I'm very happy to see all of you there. There's almost 90 attendees on this session, so that is great to see all of you here. 
Uh, when Mark asked me to talk about uh, previous pavements, I was torn. And, um, you know, there's so many great uh, products that are out there. I wasn't sure what I wanted to talk about. So I'm really putting a mix of things right now for you to talk, to think about. And when we get into the, eventually the face-to-face -face discussion, hopefully on this, we can dive into some of those in more detail. So my name is Vic Bopna. I'm at CWE. I'm a principal uh, at CWE. Um, I was thinking just this morning how many years of experience I had, and I almost wanted to say, you know, I almost have 30 years, but I want to scale that back to 28 and a half years of experience with, uh, you know, the age part doesn't work so well when you get old. Um, so with 28 and a half years of experience working with my very first project, which was the first NPDES permit for Los Angeles County and actually delineating each of the watersheds for under that NPDES permit. Um, since then, I've worked for LA County Department of Public Works and then formed CWE with um, another co-principal and worked on several, several, several great uh, pervious pavements and projects that have included pervious pavements. So diving into why would you want to put a pervious pavement down, whatever pavement it is. The easy one is to the left, improving water quality. That regulation has been coming into place quite a bit. You see it more often, you understand that. Well, what are some of the other benefits? Increased groundwater recharge is a simple one, hopefully for most places where you can have some groundwater recharge. And granted, some of our groundwater management agency staff will say that, you know, not every groundwater, not every project recharges groundwater, but some of this water eventually will end up, you know, 10, 15, 20, 100, 1,000 years into a drinkable water supply. So, that's, those are the easy ones. The ones that you do not think about much are the heat island effect, that it reduces those heat island effects, enhances the sustainability. And I can say for one of the projects that we did, our, uh, the city agency had issues with uh, flooding downstream. So they wanted to make sure that we were holding the pre-designed uh, runoff at eventually at the capacity for a 10 year event. So it's not like hydro mod where you're looking at two to five year events. And this was up to a 10 year event. So all of those are great sustainable uh, values that you can bring into a project. Um, so all of us have heard, you know, pervious pavement. Oh, the first question comes up is, oh, you know, you remember that place where we walked? That was terrible, it didn't work lack of performance data, we don't have enough data. You know, it just does not work. How does it not work? There's so many things and there's all these other comments that people will make. However, there are numerous, numerous, numerous examples of where it perfectly works and it works so well. So I would encourage all of you to continue to look into using various paver systems or payment systems as uh, your project entails. Uh, Brandon talked about a little bit about, you know, you want to look at the site. The good thing about the sites, looking at the site is there's one thing that's called a traffic index and an R value. Um, both of those help you figure out what should be your thickness or how should your pavement be. So if you have a, uh, a parking lot, which is traffic, which is lighter traffic, say, you know, lower speeds for parking lots, of course, uh, you have only cars that are coming out versus you have trucks that are parking because that structure will change of what you're designing for. Also, Caltrans has some great resources um, available because they have done a lot of testing of these types of pavements. So it gives you a lot of interesting information there. You want to look at your watershed. Where is your water coming from? What does it have? And where is it going? Because that is what you want to make sure that you're incorporating in your design uh, to hold as part of the pavement work. 
geotechnical consideration is one of the most important things you want to know. You have sandy soils, clay soils, silty soils. What are your infiltration rates? And looking at all of that information helps you make that design better. And then the construction is where it helps the most. Um, here's just something that we like to incorporate in our designs and into our construction is as the runoff comes in, it gets pretreated and then goes into the pervious pavement. Um, the overflow from that, um, we usually try and have it go into bioretention and that's to reduce the amount of water that gets into the waterways and the storm drains. And then the overflow from those bioretention systems um, actually end up to the storm drains. So with part of the design done, we get into construction. So now we have had excavation there. And of course the engineer has marked, you know, what kind of uh, gravel they want as a base. And so you can see some of the, photo the top photograph, which is the base that you can see. On the bottom, you see there's a lot more finds in here. And I wanted to play this video for you, even though the designer may request what is So what is, you know, how, much, how clean the soil or gravel needs to be. In this video, you'll see how there is more dust that is coming up. And you'll also see the, in the video that, you know, it is wet. So the, the, the gravel the vendor actually tried to help that process, but wasn't that successful. So anyway, once you get into, and I, I'm specifically talking about uh, concrete, pervious concrete uh, today, you want to have a test panel done. And depending on the site, you want to have several test panels done as you're pouring various portions of your pavement. Um, this is a test panel that is first installed to see how that is being worked on. This was about an acre site, uh, close to an acre site. Uh, that was being constructed. So this was the test panel that was installed. Um, also, once the pavement is installed, it has been cured, you want to see what the infiltration rates are. And it's a simple test in the ring uh, test that you do. You can actually see how much water is going in, up and down uh, or going through the system. The photograph on the bottom right is actually they're coring for a sample. Uh, to see what is the thickness of the pavement that was there that was placed in the testing. So this is what you want to see. You, in this particular case, it's a nine inch pavement section and that's been installed. It comes out very nice and clean and the core you can see, you can see at the bottom the gravel that's placed uh, below the pavement. And this is all great, which is what you want to see. This is not what you want to see where you can see on the bottom, on the left side of the picture, that there is only a partial cut of the core. You can see on the right side that the core is actually came out broken. So that is not what you wanna see in their pavements. And then when construction is all done and rains do come, this is what you see on your pavement. The best part about this is, as you can see well, how little of water is coming through, and as you see, I'm panning this photograph up, it's an inch of rain that is falling an inch per hour of intensity out of six acres. And you can see how great it works as a project from both a pretreatment perspective in infiltrating the water. So things to note as you're looking for construction, the quality of the material is very important. The sub base and actually, or the base if you will, and the concrete itself. Um, contractor's experience. If you're a public agency, you wanna find out that whoever the contractor is, what are, how many pavements that have they placed, it's not their first, second, third job. It's you know their 50th, 100th job that they've done. Uh, so you wanna look for that because it really is a science. Whereas they, it, it's an art more than a science as it's being poured. Uh, because that is the contractor's experience. 
uh, pretreatment of runoff is helpful. As you can see in the photograph on the right, as the pavement changes, that runoff from the other pavement does come and starts to plug your pay, uh, pervious system in. And so having a maintenance protocol will also help with that process. With that, um, we'll have, we'll go to the next uh, speaker and we'll have questions after this. Thank you. Mark, if you can hear me, you're on mute. Do you mind unmuting and starting over? Oh, geez, I did it before, I thought. Sorry. Again, hi. Um, apologize for that. I've been doing that a lot regularly. <laughs> uh, this is Mark Palmer uh, coming to you from Puyallup, Washington. Uh, I have over 20 years of experience in porous pavements specifically. I've been practicing in porous pavements uh, since the early 90s. Uh, We've been extensively using uh, porous pavements up here in uh, Washington State, in particular, uh, Puyallup and the city of Tacoma have been leaders in the Northwest in the utilization of porous pavements. Uh, my role currently is with, uh, as a senior engineer with Sound Transit, the transit agency for the Puget Sound Basin area. Uh, pre prior to that, I was the uh, city engineer and stormwater engineer for the city of Puyallup where I developed many of the projects, including the one you're seeing on the screen now, uh, which is the 8th Avenue uh, retrofit project, which is a um, combination of porous asphalt, pervious concrete, and permeable pavers uh, in a neighborhood in the city of Puyallup. Uh, dozens of experience uh, in projects here. I've uh, been working heavily with the Washington State University Extension at the Puyallup uh, in developing uh, porous pavements and progressing that. And what we'll be talking about uh, here today is some of the advances in permeable pavements. Uh, first, just want to kind of do a brief introduction on the history of permeable pavements and then talk about some of the mixed designs and material testing advances we've done in permeable pavements, uh, primarily focused on porous asphalt, but also addressing uh, pervious concrete as well. Uh, other speakers have talked about the benefits of permeable pavement, uh, but we'll touch upon that as well. And we'll touch upon the uh, permeable pavement standards that have been developed here and adopted uh, statewide uh, in the permeable pavement under our WASHDOT specifications and been the first recognized statewide specifications that uh, we've had available up here for use in permeable pavements. Permeable pavements, uh, you, know, you might expect, is a relatively recent phenomenon, but they've really uh, started evolving uh, as early as the 1940s. Uh, initially started off as uh, friction courses to help improve uh, traction on highways and, and roads, uh, used open graded friction courses. Eventually, uh, that evolved into a open grade or a full depth porous pavement. Uh, the Franklin Institute was key in developing that, and the earliest uh, full porous asphalt uh, installations were done uh, as early as the 1970s. And 1977, Walden Pond Project was a highly uh, studied and researched project where a lot of lessons uh, came out of that in regards to porous pavements. We learned a lot of the things that uh, we're aware of today in, in porous pavement uh, installations such uh, as you know, try to prevent run on to pavements because that can be uh, conducive to clogging the, the porous pavements. Uh, the focus was from that report primarily on uh, the permeability of the pavements, again, because they did have some of the issues with run on and other concerns. Uh, so the, fo the one thing about the Walden Pond report that came out of here that basically uh, could have set us back a considerable amount is there was a continual focus on uh, the porosity of the pavement versus the durability and serviceability of, of the pavement over uh, the coming years. That led to a tendency uh, in porous pavement, uh, particularly porous asphalt, in many situations of 
uh, focusing on that, uh, keeping the porosity through measures which were counterintuitive to standard pavement practice, such as reducing the amount of compaction on the pavement, uh, which again is not a good pavement practice, but it was thought to be improving the permeability of the pavement. So there were some issues there. As was mentioned by Vic, you know, performance data uh, and other indicators have been around that have made people hesitant to utilize and adopt porous pavements. And some of those practices are uh, where some of those issues have come from on uh, porous asphalt in particular. Uh, porous asphalt eventually was going to be used in, in mostly low volume uh, applications and trails and parking lots. Again, that focus on permeability led to minimal compaction of those pavements, which tended to lead to rutting and raveling issues on porous asphalt, which is where you may have seen some of the issues uh, in the past, where you also have low speed turn raveling uh, on the pavement. Uh, the rutting, as I mentioned, again, uh, it, it will compact over time under traffic. Uh, and then when it does so, it can uh, clog. In concrete, there's a lot of uh, joint spalling and impervious concrete issues. So those were so, some of the things that developed as we went around. Eventually, uh, there's a lot of thought and effort put into porous asphalt and involving that and combining other uh, improvements to porous asphalt to increase the rut resistance that included using higher uh, quality pay, or, uh, asphalt cements, uh, ones that included polymer modified asphalts, uh, also included uh, coming up with compaction standards, and these are included in the WASHDOT GSPs uh, that were developed uh, for Washington State, uh, where we do have uh, <clears throat> standards for compaction now for porous pavement and the porous ATB that is going under it. Uh, porous ADB has been a key component in improving the porous asphalt uh, pavement uh, performance here and providing greater strength and stability and rut resistance to uh, the porous pavements. Uh, warm mix asphalts that are being demonstrated in the photographs here on the right are also uh, conducive to better constructability and, and uh, compaction of the porous asphalt pavements. Some of the things that we're currently looking at uh, in, in Washington include looking at the use of fibers in pavements and uh, including uh, recycled asphalt pavements, recycled asphalt shingles, and the uh, results on this has actually been uh, very dramatic and very positive thus far. Uh, rut resistance on previous mixes of porous asphalt without these additives. Uh, was not meeting the Hamburg test for rut resistance, was not even coming close. Uh, standard is uh, less than 10 millimeters in 10,000 or 15,000 passes, I'm sorry, 15,000 passes. Uh, it was getting only three to four millimeters before, it, or three, three to 4,000 passes before it would fail. Uh, with the additives, as you can see in the graph uh, on the right, uh, it was actually beyond 20,000 uh, passes of the wheel before, we, we got to even 3.3, um, 3.7 millimeters of deflection uh, in that pavement. So it was a really dramatic increase in the rut resistance of the pavement. Again, focusing on the serviceability and life cycle of the pavement versus the uh, porosity. Uh, since the porosity of the pavement has typically uh, not been as much of an issue uh, for the pavements overall. Uh, the road you see here is one of the first ones that we did with the recycled, uh, excuse me, with the uh, Kevlar fibers in the uh, pavement mix in a local neighborhood road. Uh, cost information has been gathered on this, and that again is promising when we start looking, at, particularly in our area. Again, I'm talking specifically for the Northwest. I don't know if this would apply for California or not, but recycled asphalt uh, or recycled shingles is a very low cost commodity, virtually a no cost additive, and it has actually shown performance on par with uh, fibers and other additives to increase the rut resistance of porous asphalt pavements. Previous concrete pavements, and we adopted standards here for that, and followed the uh, ACI standards fairly closely. Um, one of the most uh, interesting advances, though, has been the adoption of internal cure admixtures to the pavement. Uh, this has many benefits besides uh, workability of the, the cement 
pavement or cement to when it's going down. It does allow for innovative uh, changes, such as not having to cover the pervious concrete with plastic immediately following placement because it is an internal cure uh, hydration compound that uh, allows a slower cure. You can just place a regular curing compound on the surface and, and walk away from it. It also does allow, because of that lack of uh, plastic curing in there, the use of saw cut joints, which are uh, much more uh, durable when we're talking about roadway surfaces and traveled, traveled areas uh, for pervious concrete. So these ideas were being uh, tested I did, uh, uniquely enough at the IDEA School, which is a science and technology school in Tacoma. Uh, we had a grant from Ecology to test some of these measures and uh, put them in practice at the IDEA School. So some of the goals and issues was to, again, dur further pavement durability, uh, enhance our design standards that had already been adopted and increase the confidence in permeable pavements, which is, uh, the underlying goal of this and try to fill the gaps where we had the material testing uh, that was consistent with permeable pavement because a lot of the conventional tests for pavements are not really applicable to permeable pavements. Uh, look at permeable pavement for water quality. It's one of the biggest things that we had wanted to pursue here is recognizing the uh, ability of porous pavements to uh, include water quality uh, improvements in the pavement itself and try to reduce the pavement surface for outer going. Uh, again, we also looked at a uh, composite section for the pervious pavement, which included a porous ATB as its base instead of uh, aggregate base, uh, jointing and not jointing. And we actually looked at not jointing in pervious concrete sections. We did some of those here on this site and including synthetic fibers uh, into the pervious concrete mix as well. On the porous asphalt, we tested Kevlar fibers, carbon composite fibers. That might be because we have a local air, airplane manufacturer here that has a lot of excess carbon uh, composite fibers that they're willing to give away. And of course, uh, recycled asphalt shingles. Again, we studied a lot of the testing rates and different ways to be testing the materials. And we'll go into that in, in more detail uh, in the long uh, session that we'll have later this year and looking at the wear and tear and cracking. We'll be monitoring this site over the course of several years, as will the students on the site as part of their science curriculum on the site. Um, it's already been touched on by others uh, why we should use consider uh, pay permeable pavements, and there's lots of considerations. Uh, I want to throw in cost effectiveness, maybe one of them as a, as a bit of a tease, but also water quality treatment, as is being suggested by the uh, three bottles. Uh, that are there in the, the center, which I can explain uh, are the two on the outside are both from permeable pavements and the other one is coming directly from runoff uh, from a standard pavement. Uh, but we'll get into more detail with that. I want to give up my time for the uh, next presenter and we'll have questions at the end. And thank you. Mark, my turn. Good. How we doing? Can you see my screen? All good? Okay, um, thanks for, for having me, Mark. I appreciate you organizing this. My name is Greg Novick. I'm with Porous Technologies, also with Stormwater Compliance. Um, I, I own and operate two different stormwater businesses. Stormwater Compliance um, is a post-construction stormwater inspection and maintenance company. We've been operating for about 15 years uh, in northern New England. Actually, I forgot to mention greetings from Portland, Maine. Uh, I don't know if it snowed at your house this week, but it did at mine. Um, anyway, uh, uh, so we, we own and operate a, uh, a maintenance company uh, for about 15 years in uh, northern New England. Um, through our experience with our maintenance business, um, uh, we were asked to come in and do a bunch of maintenance uh, for porous materials and uh, through that came up with a, a concept and you can kind of see it behind me of, of a precast porous concrete slab. So uh, we've become sort of the go-to porous pavement maintenance company in the Northeast and we've developed a way uh, to take some of the uh, risk uh, out of using porous pavement. But today I'm going to focus on the maintenance side of things. So bear with me. Um, this is again meant to be a little bit of a teaser. 
Um, and uh, we can get into a lot more detail uh, when we uh, get together in person in a few months. Um, so let's jump in. Um, basically, I think everybody's already touched on this, but I'm gonna talk about the different porous pavements um, with regard to maintenance a little bit. Porous concrete seems to be everybody's uh, favorite of all the porous materials, or, or at least here in the Northeast, um, but it has that asterisk. It's, it's when it's placed right. We, we see so many problems, especially up here, because we have the added uh, uh, luxury of uh, winter um, that you guys don't quite experience there in Southern California. So we're not only dealing with uh, the, your normal trash and pollutants, but we're also dealing with salt, cold, freezing, freeze-thaw, heaving, all those sorts of considerations. So um, we've cut our teeth in, a, in an area that uh, uh, really helps benefit us when we go to other parts of the country where it seems to get a little easier. Um, so porous concrete uh, works great, but it, it does have some, uh, you know, has quality control issues. Porous asphalt, we've heard quite a bit about that from Mark uh, Palmer. Um, uh, here's an example. This is in uh, Greenland, New Hampshire. Uh, most of my stuff is back east. Uh, interlocking uh, pavers. I like to point out that the pavers themselves are not pervious, not porous. It's actually the joints uh, within the pavers. So you're concentrating flow and concentrating sediment within those joints. A typical paver installation is actually 80% impervious and the, the joints represent plus or minus 20%, uh, which is the actual pervious area. Um, so when we talk about run-on, you're, you're sort of in a run-on scenario uh, before you even allow any water to flow in. Um, and then one new topic uh, that we like to talk about um, is precast porous concrete. This is a, the new kid on the block, um, but the advantage in the precast versus say uh, the port in place is that uh, uh, the precast is modular uh, and it's got quality control. So, so these, these slabs tend to be produced uh, under controlled conditions indoors um, all the, the curing, which is the major issue with port in place uh, materials, kind of comes out of play now because they're all cured under controlled conditions. So we'll talk a little bit about the precast porous concrete, but again, going to focus more on the maintenance today. Um, first of all, we've got to talk about uh, inspection and maintenance, but we really inspection. Inspection and or sweeping in Southern California, typically two times per year. I put a little asterisk there. Um, uh, you know, frequencies can can change up and down. Sometimes maybe depending on the application, you only need to get out there once a year, uh, or you might be, you might need to maintain three or four times a year. We, we encourage inspect frequently and maintain appropriately. So we get out there and recommend to inspect two to four times a year um, and document and then come back and do the maintenance based on what you see on your inspections, not just blindly come out and clean four or six or 10 times a year. So uh, we, we recommend twice a year, um, but that again, depending can go up and down, but really you'd probably wanna come in after the spring rainy season. Um, and then again in the fall, after you've been through a whole most of your year, you come back and sweep again ahead of the rainy season to try to open things up again. So that's our typical recommendation. Um, uh, in New England, I kind of say two to four times a year because we have that whole winter thing that you guys don't experience. Um, detailed inspection should include, first of all, you just wanna make sure that good housekeeping practices are, are happening across the entire site. Um, you wanna look for places where you have uh, uh, unstable soils that could, could uh, migrate material onto your porous pavement um, and those sorts of things. Look for potential uh, spills and so forth. Um, uh, we talk about looking, make sure the surface is checked for signs of ponding. Um, this is actually an interesting application I'm showing here on the screen. This is porous asphalt. You can see uh, where the porous asphalt uh, ends and where the regular asphalt begins. Um, in this case, it, it, it failed. Uh, this is in, in New Hampshire. Um, what the contractor is doing, they actually replaced this with, uh, with a modular system with the, with the, with the stormcrete, the precast slabs. Um, you can see the contractor is actually saw cutting. They, he got tired of waiting for the puddle to go away. So you can see him actually saw cutting through the puddle. Um, and then uh, Mark touched on it again, spalling, surface deterioration. Um, here's some porous con uh, concrete. And again, you can see it raveling. And the problem with porous concrete is when it goes in, it's typically mostly unconsolidated when it's placed. Um, so there's no real compaction effort. Uh, you're, you're screening the top to make it flat and level. 
and you're rolling the top, but usually not with much compaction effort. Um, so if you do have any issues on the surface, uh, they tend to spread and they tend to go down. And if you're not careful, you end up with a gravel parking lot at the end of the, uh, of the year or two years or five years. So we see this very often. Again, these, are, these are, are sort of the reasons why, let's see if I can go back. These are sort of the reasons why we kind of stumbled onto the idea of going with a modular system that has quality control because we, in New England, we've seen so many issues on the maintenance side. Um, uh, obviously, we want to check for voids to make sure there's no accumulation of material, especially as Mark pointed out in that run on area. Um, and then uh, again, you know, uh, we're concentrating flow in pavers. The pavers look great uh, when they go in, they work great when they go in, but over time they uh, tend to choke down. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the maintenance of pavers versus uh, the other materials. Um, you want to check for accidental spills, discharge, anything like that, of course. And then uh, you want to prepare a log. You need to prepare an annual inspection report, inspection and maintenance report. Um, and more and more with uh, MS4s and uh, NPDES permits out there, um, this requirement is coming. You need a written report, um, and towns are starting to require it. Um, so let's talk about um, the different types of maintenance. We have routine maintenance, all right? That's sort of your ongoing maintenance. Unfortunately, our maintenance business, we typically get the phone call after four or five or six years of, of nothing, right? Hey, uh, our porous is plugged, the town came out, they yelled at us, uh, please, we need help. Can you get out here and help us out? So that would be more for deep cleaning. We'll talk about that in a second, but routine cleaning. Um, this is actually a ride-on machine. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned we have our maintenance company. Here's stormwater compliance, our maintenance company. We have regenerative air vacuum sweepers, um, and we also have what we call the stormwater SUV. Um, we've helped develop this, and we actually market this as well, but it's a ride-on machine. This is a, a, a gutter line, a, a, a precast porous concrete gutter that we're cleaning uh, in this case. Um, but it's very maneuverable. You can do alleyways, gutter lines, smaller areas. When we get into large parking areas and, you know, an acre or two acres of porous pavement, that's when we start getting into the regenerative air machines. Um, and then, of course, we have focus cleaning, which, again, we typically get phone calls uh, to get out there and help somebody out of a jam. Um, and there's a couple of ways you can do it. A, a little bit more of a crude method is to pressure wash, to use a pressure washer. Um, but typically you don't want to just pressure wash because if you move the material, it's just going to uh, infiltrate down uh, right next to it, right? So you can see here, we actually have a, a handheld vacuum off the side of one of our sweeper trucks and we direct uh, the sediment and pick it up with the va vacuum head. So just pressure washing isn't enough. Um, down below, I wanted to show you a quick example and I, I, I decided not to put in videos. I've got all kinds of stuff. So when we're when we're together, I can really expand on all this. I just kind of wanted to use this as a little bit of a teaser. Um, this is a, a product called the BIRD, Bunyan Infiltration Restoration Device is what it stands for. But the, the long and the short of it is, is we've got 15, uh, uh, 1500 PSI nozzles. So we've got 15 nozzles underneath this pickup head. This pickup head is attached to a Vactor truck. Okay, so we have high pressure water combined with high pressure suction. And the, the combination of the two helps us open up uh, completely plugged porous pavement. Um, with the asphalt, we're actually cleaning asphalt here. We tend to strip the asphalt off with, the, uh, with that machine. In other words, with asphalt, what we've found is at the end of the day, asphalt's a liquid. Uh, when it's hot and it gets real hot, it, it gets sticky, okay? So sediment that gets into the pores tend to stick to the, the, the asphalt and uh, it becomes very, very difficult for us to clean out once your asphalt has become plugged. That, that, that sediment becomes part of the matrix, basically. Um, so when we go in and clean uh, with the bird, um, we actually find a whole bunch of uh, asphalt material within the machine. The porous concrete, uh, actually reacts the best to the bird because it holds its structure. It's it's concrete. It holds up to the the pressure washing and the and the vacuuming, and we're able to re rejuvenate porous concrete very nicely with this piece of equipment. Um, porous pavers. When we first started using this on porous pavers, we were sucking the pavers into the truck. Okay, so we literally cleaned so deep within the joints 
um, that we would suck those into the, the, the truck, we, we actually have come up with a way that we can use uh, the bird on porous pavers uh, without, without removing the pavers. Um, uh, but then we talk about that joint stone and you need to get that joint stone uh, back inside of uh, those joints. That's really important and not always uh, uh, easy to do. Um, so let's talk about types of sweepers. Again, I'm not going to really expand on any of this other than to tell you that what's out there and what we typically recommend. Now, uh, first you, you start off with mechanical sweepers, broom sweepers. Um, and here you can see a great example. Well, barely, but you can kind of see a great example of a broom sweeper. But we don't like brooms on porous pavement of any type. Um, the brooms don't do the porous material any favors. Um, it tends to chip away at the asphalt or the porous concrete. Um, and it just uh, becomes a dusty mess. So the, the stuff that was out in front of the broom just lands behind it and, and you're almost back to where you started from almost out of the gate. So brooms in general, we try to avoid with porous pavement. It also, the brooms tend to drive the, the material into the voids as opposed to pulling it out, believe it or not. At least that's our experience. Um, vacuum sweepers are a little better. Here is a brand new vacuum sweeper. And, and uh, I think it was, was the first or second day it was out on the streets in South Portland, Maine. Um, you can barely see the traffic control guy here on the right. So again, um, what you have is a broom. Most vacuum sweepers actually have a broom underneath them that pushes all the material to one side. And then you have about an 18 inch wide or a 30 inch wide pickup head that vacuums the material. So it's a little misleading. People think you want a vacuum, um, but you're not getting a vacuum on the full pass of the machine. You're only getting a vacuum for a very small pass. So what seems like uh, it would be a great idea doesn't always work so well. Um, the third type are regenerative air vacuum sweepers. And, and uh, I showed you a picture of one of ours earlier, um, but really the, the, the idea behind these is that it's the full pass of the machine is the pickup head you can see right here on the bottom. And what it is, is it, it, it regenerates, regenerative air, it regenerates. So it's a blast of air down. That blast of air is meant to loosen the material and then you vacuum it up. And, and this is supposed to be, and I'll, I'll use finger quotes, uh, a dust-free operation. It's as dust-free as you get in the, in the pervious vacuuming world, but um, nonetheless, uh, uh, there still is a little bit of dust associated with it. Um, I'm, I'm not showing an example, and again, my larger presentation would kind of show this, but um, one piece of equipment I'll just mention by name is a, uh, a billy goat. And a billy goat is basically a hand walk behind vacuum. Um, they don't work, don't use them. They're just not strong enough. Um, I had to actually rent one uh, to do a maintenance demonstration for New York City to prove to them that they don't work because they just wouldn't believe it. So yeah, you wanna stay away from the handheld uh, smaller machines. Um, so those are the different types of machines. Uh, when we get into pavers, yes, you can use those sweepers, but when, when they're plugged, there's the, the, the regenerative air machines. And again, my, my regenerative air machine is right here, but it's not good enough to loosen that material. We actually have to typically go in with a bristle broom and, and broom the entire area to loosen the material. Um, then you can see the guys are out there blowing the material out into the street. Here's our stormwater SUV picking up some of that loosened material. Um, then we have to come through, here's our machine again, and we pick up all that material. Um, then we have to legally dispose of the material. And then most importantly, you have to sweep material back into the joints. Now we're supposed to do that two to four times a year, twice a year in California, I said. So that can be uh, very labor intensive. So the pavers start off looking great, working great. They seem to be everybody's favorite, but I can tell you that uh, from our maintenance crew's perspective, they're not their favorite. They're their least favorite to work on. Um, and, and, and basically we have to charge a bunch more because of the added uh, hand uh, labor that goes along with them. So they're, you know, in the right location, it's a good application, but when you start getting into gutter lines and streets where you're gonna have some heavier loads, um, you want to start shying away a little bit from your porous pavement. And that goes back to some of the other talks when, when you're taking your design considerations. You want to think about what kind of sediment loads are going to happen and then pick a, a type of material that, that goes along with it. Um, the, the, the precast uh, panels, so all, the other, all that other maintenance, you saw what we do with, uh, uh, with pavers. Um, 
the other material, the other machines and equipment and all of that was kind of uh, focused on porous concrete and porous asphalt. Um, porous concrete, both poured in place and uh, modular, a modular system. Um, but when you get into the precast system, beyond just the normal vacuuming and other, uh, other uh, ways of cleaning, um, you do have the added advantage with a precast system where you could actually pull out a slab. And this is not routine. Remember, this is, uh, this is more focused cleaning. You can actually pull out a slab, flip it over, back flush it, and then, gotcha, Mark, two more slides. Um, and then, uh, and flush it, and then, uh, the last option with a, a precast system is under a worst case scenario, something goes terribly wrong, you can always remove and replace a slab. Um, uh, uh, Vic kind of pointed out testing when you're done with your maintenance, you do want to test and show a before and after test. Um, we've actually developed this uh, test piece uh, of equipment. It follows the ASTM 1701 test protocol. Um, but we've created our own to make it easier for our crews. We will sell this, um, but we don't really push it too hard. But we, we you know, if you're doing a lot of testing, it, it basically it allows one person to run a test instead of multiple. Um, that's it for maintenance. Uh, uh, we'll go dive much deeper into the different types of equipment, how they work. We've got lots of videos, lots of pictures to share from our maintenance experience of our maintenance company. And there's my contact information. If you want to reach out and you have any specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to help. There you go. Stop sharing. Mark, you're muted. How about now? Can everyone yeah, hear me? Great. Thank you so much for that, Greg, and, and all the speakers. Great job. We have some excellent questions from our audience. We have eight minutes left. Uh, we're going to cover those. Uh, the first question, what I'll do, uh, Brandon, if you're, uh, if you're out there, why don't you take a start at the cost question? We've had a couple folks ask about cost and some cost options. So Brandon, uh, pl please go. Now, as far as cost for the different types of installations, uh, unfortunately, that's going to depend on the site, you know, the depth and the underlying conditions and what the goal is. Uh, if it's infiltration and it's a subgrade that is going to be manipulated and need a special base, that's going to vary then versus something like the precast that might be able to be put on native for a sidewalk. So whoever asked that question, if they could please maybe look at a couple of different applications, then we would be able to provide a, a better ballpark for the different alternatives out there. I apologize for nothing specific there, but it really does depend on the use, the solution, and, and the scenario. So more detail would be greatly appreciated. Good answer. Now, another one that a, a person asked, and thank you for this, and this is Vic, I, I wanna direct this towards you because I. I'm a so I came up in a soil science uh, background, and I'm always curious about that. The question is: It's clear that porous pavements are good, but you don't often hear about the downsides. Are there some locations to avoid? Are parking lots really a, a good idea? And, and my addition to that is: You see a lot of you're an engineer, a lot of soils considerations. Maybe some thoughts on that. So, in areas that are sandy and silty, yes, they work well but areas that are more of a clay soil, uh, you have more of the contracting and expanding soils occurring there, so you'll have an issue. The good part about pavements, um, these are more of a flexible pavement, if you will, uh, that the sub-base design accommodates for that movement. So that's the good part about it. So you can use it at pretty much most of the locations, um, in terms of the question of uh, whether parking lots are the best locations or not, from a perspective of a groundwater recharge, it depends on how your infiltration rates are and what is that pretreatment that it provides. Uh, what treatment do you have before that? And the pavement provides certain amount of treatment because there is bacteria that grows through there that will eat the oils and uh, grease that actually falls onto that parking lot. But in, if when you're thinking from a water quality perspective only, 
um, if it was just regular concrete pavement that runs off and goes into our waterways and that's why you have these TMDLs. So um, generally most locations are pretty good for placing these pavement structures. Great, Vic, good job. I, I wanna, Mark Palmer, I wanna ask you this question and I, I have a, a related one as well. And how easy is, and this is from our audience, thank, and th again, thank you on the audience for your, your great questions. How easy is permeable pavement testing? Can the agency do it by themselves or do you have to hire a contractor? And you know, you're up in Puyallup, uh, different climate of where I'm from, Washington State, where I'm from. Maybe just talk a little bit about climate variation and, and its effect on, on the use of, of permeable pavement and permeable pavement technologies. Yeah, and, and most of the, the tests, uh, uh, generally we're having uh, small municipalities up here I've been dealing with. We have testing labs do most of our testing anyway, as far as uh, some of the tests that we have going. The permeability test, as you saw in uh, Greg's slide, that's something you can do with your own staff. Uh, and that's easily done and, and most of our staff did uh, follow up with permeability tests. We, City of Puyallup has been following some of the permeability tests over time to see how those things are going. Uh, particularly for porous asphalt, you will have variations in the asphalt that you're actually using in each of your areas because that is temperature dependent and, and climate dependent. But generally speaking, the, the porous pavement, uh, porous asphalt should be a polymer modified uh, grade of asphalt and usually one uh, one notch above what you'd be using as your standard in regular dense graded roads, in, in generally speaking. That's, that's the main consideration. I, I see a real specific consideration, uh, question here, uh, Greg, or, or excuse me, Mark Palmer, maybe you can ask the, answer this, and if, if you can't, someone else may, perhaps can. How much, uh, the ASTM 1701 test kit, uh, can, can you, uh, one audience member asked, how much does that cost? Is that an easy answer? Right. Mark, Mark, I can jump in on that if you want. Yeah, and then there's a couple others there too, uh, Greg, since you've got the mic. Uh, just the, if you, the, Yeah, I, I saw a couple on maintenance. I'll jump on yeah. those. I, I was kind of reading through those. Yeah, thank so, you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can share my screen again. I don't think I can right now. Maybe maybe we can allow it. Um, but uh, the, the 1701 test is a fairly simple, fairly inexpensive test, and basically anybody can run it. Okay, so you can go as far as, I guess it looks like I'm allowed to share my screen again, so I'll just kind of throw this up there again. Sure, um, thank you. So, so this, this uh, uh, bar here, uh, or, or you know, you can, you can take a five gallon bucket and cut the top off and, and create a ring with that. Um, you need two lines when you do the test. It's hard to see, but maybe you can see there's two lines that are about a couple of millimeters apart. The idea is that it's supposed to be a consistent falling head test. Oh, here you can see the two lines better over here. We have those actually uh, scaled right into this, this loop here. Um, and the idea is to keep the water uh, at a constant level uh, between those two lines. Um, we do it uh, by using a valve here, all right? But it, it can be as simple as uh, one person pouring a bucket of water into a hoop uh, and somebody with a stopwatch. So it could be as much as whatever your labor is for two people uh, and a little bit of, you know, home, a trip to Lowe's or Home Depot and, and you can run it. You also need plumber's putty. So uh, this device here is a real fancy way of doing it. We put the plumber's putty right underneath the stainless steel uh, uh, to, to, uh, to tighten it to the porous itself. Um, we have this fancy uh, bar that actually has all your calculations. So if it's, uh, nine 160 seconds it's 220 inches an hour so you can know what your infiltration rates are right away um then we then we created our own little uh frame to hold our five gallon bucket in and we can control the water so with this rig uh one person can do the test versus two this rig is like 800 to a thousand dollars to to buy a rig and and, and it could be anywhere down to 50 bucks if you want to send a couple of people out and and do it a little more crude. Um, but we have crews out solo all the time and we wanna be able to perform these tests quickly and easily. Uh, I would guess that if you could just have one person versus two, it, something like this pays for itself pretty quick. In terms of maintenance, um, it, it's a tough one. Vic had mentioned earlier, when you're, when you're dealing with porous pavements, it's a little bit of an art uh, as much as a science. Um, and certainly that goes with the, with the porous pavement maintenance. If I have to give a raw number, I would say somewhere between eight and 10 cents a square foot 
for routine maintenance of porous asphalt and porous concrete. That means we're uh, basically going ahead and going around with uh, either the SUV or regenerative air <clears throat> machine, and we're vacuuming uh, the whole parking lot. And we would be at somewhere about point, you know, about eight cents to 10 cents a square foot and, and up from there. Uh, knowing though that, you know, uh, just in Southern California, it's gonna cost you 500 to $750 just to show up on site for most of these people till they get through traffic and get their equipment and their, and their people there. So if it's a really small area, it's not gonna be eight or 10 cents if you've got 50 square feet. It's still gonna be 500 bucks as a minimum. So those are some of those Great. costs. Excellent. It, it, I, I, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to chime in on Greg's comments just a little bit. I do have cost data for City of Gallup and, and our maintenance, and I think it's in the same realm and range that Greg has said. The, the thing I'd like to point out, you know, the regenerative air sweepers that Greg mentioned are the uh, primary way to do routine maintenance. And, and in the City of Puyallup, we're more than aggressive on that and actually sweep every street in the city, not just our porous pavements, but every street in the city with a, per, with a regenerative air sweeper once a month. That has keep, kept all of our porous pavements that are on our roads, including our main arterials. We do have at least three arterials with pervious, pervious pavements on them, and they are functioning well over several years using that type of maintenance. And that's, that's what I've seen is uh, uh, keep that routine maintenance up, particularly on roads, and it will function fine. Um, I agree, and, and when, we, when we go in to, to maintain a porous pavement area, let's say it's just the parking stalls and not the whole parking lot, um, we vacuum the entire parking lot because the, the, any sediment that's not within the porous is going to make it to the porous. So uh, kind of in, 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 in thinking with what Mark just said. And, and just to get on that, that is the one thing that I, if I have one recommendation to any designers out there, do anything you can with your porous pavements to prevent runoff. Design it so it does not have runoff. Intercept it before it gets to the pavement. If you have that interface, you will have additional maintenance concerns at that interface between the two pavements. We, yep, we see that as well. Uh, I, 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 we, we have actually with our, with our slabs, we have what we call a run-on row. We put our smallest slabs up against where the run-on comes in. It's almost like a sacrificial row mm -hmm. in that application. So. You know, we, because it's modular, you can pull them out. Um, there was another question about the bird and the cost of the bird. Well, uh, you know, when we talk, whoops, when we talk about routine maintenance, uh, where am I? Sorry. Um, you know, routine maintenance is that eight cents to 10 cents a square foot. Um, when we get into porous, uh, you know, re rejuvenating, deep cleaning, focus cleaning, deep cleaning, um, that's an expensive day. We've got two uh, expensive pieces of equipment in, in a Vactor truck, as well as uh, the stormwater SUV hauling around this bird head. Um, and then you're going to have a crew of three or four folks uh, out there as well. Um, I can't really give you, we can do something like 30 to 40,000 square feet in a day. And here in New England, we typically charge somewhere around eight or $10,000 a day to rehabilitate plugged porous because not only do we have to pay for all the labor and all the equipment, we have to pay for disposal of all that material. We've got to access water. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot going on when you start dealing. But usually, people are happy to pay that because the only al other alternative is to rip it out and put new in. Yeah. And I'll I'll jump on that again too, Greg. We we have uh, in Pierce County. He's got a vehicle called the Municipal Cleaning Vehicle, uh, which has a very similar concept, except it's self uh, self propelled to the bird. Uh, and right on there, the same cost, eight, eight, five to eight thousand dollars a day to run that equipment, it, and it covers about the same area you mentioned. This is Mark Gray again, and I, I just we've got a we can uh, go a little more. I've I've got a few more questions I'd like to get to if we can answer them shortly. I think I, I just want to all the participants out there. Thank you very much. I want to get to these last questions, and uh, and thank you, Maroon El Haje and, and Michael for these two good questions. I'll, uh, one of them is on pervious pavements in the right of way, how do you protect for existing buried utilities and their surrounding trench backfill um, as they could become channels for the runoff? And then related to that, uh, Michael asks, has anyone had experience with installing pervious concrete and curb and gutter? And uh, he adds that I can see it uh, being a possible solution for locations with ponding issues. So uh, maybe just a couple, couple thoughts on that. Vic, you're, I, I know you're a skilled construction engineer. 
Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll take the comment on the curb and gutter. Actually, it's a great installation location. You have your dry weather uh, flows that actually come on there. They, they literally get infiltrated. One of the concerns you wanna make sure is the base for the roadway that is uh, being impacted or not. So you wanna make sure that uh, the water is not going into the sub base of the roadway. So you want to put up, uh, prevent, uh, you want to prevent that water going in there. So put a pervious, uh, impervious layer uh, through that section. Uh, for utility uh, conduits, that has always been our concern. And one of the things if we cannot do anything about is we'll actually, uh, at the edge of our channel section, depending on what the utility is in place, uh, the, the, the backfill part, we'll actually put a stopper at the end of our work so that it's not yeah. passing through. So basically encasing the last, you know, five feet or so um, of the trench backfill with concrete instead of like sand or other materials. Yeah. And I Great. agree with Vic yeah, on please, that. Please, trench, please dam, trench, dam, trench, dam, trench dam works well on that. But the other thing I would say is generally the backfill materials, at least for us, are usually a, a fairly dense graded rock and they're tend to be uh, less pervious than the surrounding native ground and most of the uh, water is going to be infiltrated into that native ground versus into the trench backfill itself that's heavily compacted as well. Well, great. And, and then just to finish it out, uh, Doug Grove asks, how does the cost, uh, and I think he, uh, Doug was meaning the, uh, the, the permeable pavement maintenance, but how does it co the cost compare to permeable paver maintenance and then Clayton asks, what is expected lifespan compared to normal concrete? And I can imagine there's a range. We'll conclude on those two questions. Uh, guys, uh, any thoughts? Um, I, I'll take the last question, the normal concrete versus lifespan. Um, actually comparable, um, depending on how the system is placed, uh, you can actually cut certain sections and reconstruct those. So it's an easier replacement instead of having this long length of concrete that is, you know, breaking and stuff um, that sits there. Uh, I, my, I, I, even though, you know, my experience is close to 30 years, I haven't seen previous pavement systems in Southern California for 30 years. So I can't say uh, the definition to that. Maybe, uh, Mark, you may have some additional experience based on other areas within the country or Greg? Uh, I'd say in my experience thus far is the, the pavements, particularly those that have adapted to the recent innovations we've done with uh, porous pavements have done very well. One thing I like to point out on porous asphalt pavements in particular is they do very well in areas where there has been uh, high groundwater or other situations uh, because they're not susceptible to the uh, uh, potholing effect that can happen in regular pavements and they don't out alligator crack and, and potholes similar to regular pavements so they're actually proving to be more durable uh, in those kind of situations. All right we've uh, we've gone over a little on time but we had such a, a, a jam-packed agenda and content today it's, it's no wonder. To the folks uh, uh, remaining thank you very much please keep in touch with us. If there's other topics you'd like to see, I think we've presented our contact information today. Please reach out to me, to our four presenters and the time that you put into this and your pre preparation. Thank you so much. And again, thank you to all our sponsors and thank you to Orange County Public Works and Orange County Parks, our, our long-term partners here at BIOC and, and Kickwick. Thank you all. Have a great uh, rest of the week and let's, uh, let's come together soon. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody.